Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's GoFly Master Lecture. To get us kicked off, I'll pass it over to Gwen Leiter, CEO and founder of GoFly. Gwen? Thanks, Paul, and hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Master Lecture. As you all know, GoFly's grand sponsor is Boeing, and we are joined by corporate sponsor Pratt & Whitney, as well as our in-kind sponsors, Global Aerospace, Onshape, Total Sim, BRS Aerospace, who we'll hear from today, Cases by Source, Fiberglass, Rockwest, and, and for Gilly. And we are so pleased today also to be joined by our organizational partners. Today we have a very exciting master lecture for you. We will be hearing from Boris Popov, who is the founder of BRS Aerospace. And Boris founded BRS in 1981, and he's currently the director and senior vice president of sales. He was born in Munich, Germany, and immigrated to the United States in 1949 through Ellis Island. He graduated from the University of Minnesota with a bachelor's in economics and a minor in aeronautical engineering in IT. He holds ratings as a private pilot and FAA ground instructor in sailplanes, hang gliding, and float planes. He has received many awards over the past years, including the 1986 Lycoming Aviation Safety Award, the 2005 Aviation Week and Space Technology Laureate Award, the 2010 Sperry Award, the 2015 Flieger Magazine Award, and the 2017 Null Award. And he's also been inducted into the 2000 EAA Ultralight Hall of Fame, the 2005 Space Hall of Fame, and the 2016 Minnesota Aviation Hall of Fame. So without further ado, I'm very pleased to welcome Boris Popov to give our next master lecture. Great, thank you very much, Gwen. Are we seeing everything on, on the screen? Yep, all good. All right, thank you again. I want to repeat that, Gwen and Paul, both of you, for, for making this possibility of showing uh, the BRS history and uh, talking about the safety aspects of integrating BRS parachutes into the VTOL uh, programs uh, go fly uh, award. So let me begin with um, uh, the, the photos that we see here are are uh, generally focused on, on uh, not only VTOL, but anything that's, that's, that's flying. Uh, it's generally uh, a matter of anything that's in the air is gonna have, have some kind of a decelerator. Uh, and these decelerators are designed for uh, not only decelerating the aircraft and bring it down to the ground with a safe, safe descent. BRS basically uh, is a, a, a company uh, with the with the philosophy and the and the focus of uh, of uh, recovering aircraft in emergency situations. So the company started by myself uh, because of a structural failure in the hang glider in 1977. Uh, since then, we've had uh, 30,000 systems installed. Uh, 300 have to update now. That we have had 386 lives saved to date. Uh, one out of 120 of the BRSs that we sell gets deployed. Uh, that's a pretty startling number when you think about it. That means every 120 aircraft owners with a BRS ultimately eventually uses that parachute. And that, that's a number that I thought I had my decimal point in the wrong place when I first, uh, first uh, realized that, uh, that ratio. So that's, a, again, a one out of 120 of the BRSs that we've sold over the years gets deployed. Uh, the market base for BRS, sport aviation, certified aircraft, military trainers, unmanned aircraft, spin recovery parachute systems, VTOL, multi-copter manned aircraft, and suborbital launch vehicles. So we have a pretty diverse product line and, and uh, diverse markets throughout the, the world. To give you an idea, I, I, I like this slide because it's easy to say 386 people, but when you look at a group of, this is roughly 400 people, you're going to realize the impact that, that ballistic shoots, not just BRSs, but all ballistic parachutes in the world. Uh, this is just the ones that we've sailed, saved. And that's, and that'll give you a, a, a 
real good visual presentation of what it means to say you've saved 386 lives. That's a lot of people. And I like to stress that if these people weren't saved, imagine the negative impact we would have had uh, even more so on, on the safety aspects of, of, of light aircraft flight. BRS was not the first uh, was not the first company or the first uh, individual to put a parachute on an aircraft. Uh, 1917 uh, was the first time anybody put a parachute on an airplane. The trouble was is that it required a parachute the size of a 50 gallon drum. Uh, it was stuff that you can see in the fuselage of an old biplane. Uh, it did work and my hat's off to these really true pioneers in the early days of aviation for at least uh, attempting to put a parachute on an airplane. It wasn't practical. It's a very, very large system, very heavy system, very slow to deploy. Uh, but at least it, it shows you that the concept of a parachute on a, an aircraft is not a new idea. What VRS accomplished was to integrate a bunch of newer technologies in parachute, uh, in the parachute market uh, through making it less obtrusive, lighter, stronger, uh, ballistically deployed. That's where VRS really historic uh, integration into the, into the uh, aviation market occurred to those, those concepts. Uh, basically, uh, we have 400 different design installations uh, for various aircraft. Uh, I, I won't go through all these details here, but basically, again, for every aircraft model, we almost have to have a new design installation. And that's, that's pretty important to understand that, that uh, whether it's a VTOL, eVTOL, or, or light sport, or general aviation aircraft, each model uh, requires a concerted engineering effort to make that particular installation work properly. It's a very expensive process, and it's a very time consuming process, but it has to be done right because the system has to work. Cirrus, as most of you know, uh, has a, a BRS system as standard equipment on their aircraft. Uh, they now have their, their own cap system on the jet as well. And it, this chart really reflects a really, uh, to me, a really poignant and uh, critical analysis of what happens when you not only put a parachute on an airplane, but what happens when you train people in the correct uh, utilization of that, of that parachute. So as you can see with the, the, the blue line here, Cirrus, when it had a thousand aircraft in the market, the, the fatality rate, uh, accident, fatal accident rate per 100,000 flight hours was quite high, well above uh, all GA and corporate and, uh, and instructional flight and personal flight. At this point, Cirrus realized that, that they've got a parachute on board. They need they need to train people to start using it. There were people dying in Cirrus that, were, that weren't using the, the parachutes because of some concerns and some lack of training as to the capabilities of the and my hat's off to Cirrus. They did a tremendous job in, in uh, training uh, aircraft owners about the capabilities of the parachute. As soon as that happened, you can see what happened here, that the flight uh, fatal accident rate per 100,000 flight hours has dropped down even below or near corporate flight levels, which is, which is really spectacular to change uh, in the safety aspects of flying a Cirrus aircraft. And again, my, my hat's off to Cirrus to realize that it's not only important to put a parachute in an airplane, it's important to train people how to, how to use that parachute. Good slide here that shows the, the component parts of a, of a parachute. Uh, you can see how it's attached to the airplane. We'll have some more details of that later. This is the parachute bag, as we call it, deployment bag. Um, parachute suspension line. This is a slider that we patented many years ago that made the parachute capable of functioning at low air speeds and low altitudes and also importantly at high altitude and high air speeds. A couple of good uh, versions of the typical installations. We have either a soft pack or a canister system. You can see obviously this is a soft pack. This is similar to what's put in the Cirrus. Um, and a lot of, uh, a lot of the installations are inside the fuselage. We also have the canister version uh, can be used either inside or outside, but more typically used on the outside or when installed on the outside of an aircraft in the environmental concerns. A lot of questions uh, about the rocket motor over the years, uh, especially when we get into eVTOL, we're going to 
probably have to go with electronic activation. Right now we have mechanical activation, which I'll show you in another later slide. But electronic activation is, is, is coming because autonomous activation is coming. Uh, I think we all understand that, that the VTOL transitionary flight from horizontal, vertical, and vertical to horizontal is going to require uh, a pretty rapid response in the part of the pilot to deploy the parachute. We don't think that a human can possibly react at those low altitudes and low air speeds quick enough to utilize the parachute's capability. So uh, we're going to go in electronic activation. It'll be a squib activated system or a servo activated system. Uh, and that's an important development for BRS uh, that we have focused on for the last four or five years. It's a good uh, demonstration of how a system, the VRS system works. This is a, one of the first serious ground test. You can see the parachute bag. Uh, you can see the airframe, airframe cover. In other words, there's a panel that gets blown away from the fuselage. The rocket strikes that, removes it. We have the extraction harness, and of course, the solid propellant uh, rocket motor. Nice slide showing the entire sequence of events during a typical deployment. And then this uh, little video will show you. Uh, classic uh, serious test deployment. You can see how fast the parachute comes out. And again, I want to stress up quickly, within one second, the parachute's beginning to decelerate the lift. These are a couple of really stunning videos. I, 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 I like to show this particular one of, of a 22-year-old uh, stunt pilot in Argentina uh, who had a wing come off during a negative G pull-up. And that's, that, to me, is, is uh, probably the worst case scenario. You can see what happened. Now watch how fast the shoot is open. As soon as you realize right there he's in trouble, Pulls the hand, and boom, the chute comes out. In less than, less than a second, he's got basically a functional parachute. Now he's coming down nose down, which is not, a, not an optimal position because the harness wasn't loaded correctly, but nevertheless, he was able to walk away from the incident uh, with, with, uh, with no injury. Another example of a, of a, a typical uh, test flight that was done on a, on a LSA. Uh, spin recovery testing obviously is important for any kind of aircraft. Uh, and during the, the, this particular sequence, the video sequence, you can see that he uh, got into a pretty hard spin. Uh, this was a very, very high time uh, test pilot. He, he did all the right things to try to recover from the spin. Uh, you can see him reach for the handle a couple times and change his mind. And I'm sure he was thinking, I can get out of this. I don't need to shoot. But as he, as he was approaching uh, the ground, he realized he's running out of altitude, running out of time, and uh, finally reaches for the handle and commits to deploying the parachute. And what's interesting to me, he shuts off the power here. You can see, you can count from the time he deploys the parachute to the time of impact. It's not very long, seven or eight seconds. Well, so he waited quite a long time to deploy the parachute, almost too long, uh, before he finally decided he better pull this thing. You can see him, you can see the straps coming out. This particular installation is in the forward, forward of, the, of the firewall between the engine and firewall. You can see the ground coming up here, boom, he hits. Uh, basically, no injuries. The only injury is he incurred is as he's getting out and he opens up the, the canopy and stands up, he gets hit in the head by the canopy. Small price to pay. <laughs> Another good slide here is, is the uh, NASA Perseus program that we worked on for NASA. This is one of the first UAVs that, that NASA developed. Uh, it, was a, it was a deployment that occurred at about, about 40 to 50,000 feet, quite a high altitude deployment. NASA approached us for a ballistic system because the cost of the avionics was exceeding the cost of the airplane. They wanted to make sure they get the avionics back. And this is a really good video of what happens when you get uh, fluttered. And if you watch real closely here, it's kind of grainy because it was such a high altitude deployment. But watch the wingtips, 
watch what happens. Uh, by definition, I would call this a structural failure by any anybody's definition. Both wings gone, tail gone, fuselage, and uh, came down at altitude, down to the ground, and uh, the avionics were recovered. NASA was very, very happy with the end result. A lot of people ask me, especially on VTOLs, is what kind of a descent rate uh, are we going to have? And basically, at VRS, we, we've learned over the years through empirical testing and, and uh, some good engineering modeling that, that, that 25 to 30 feet per second is in, in an aircraft with landing gear is a, is a typically a good uh, and sustainable uh, descent rate that will not cause serious injuries. And what that means, as you can see here, this is a little bit of slow motion. This is done for the Indian Air Force in their trainer aircraft. You can see what that means as far as a touchdown configuration. First, the nose gear hits, and then the main gear takes up the rest of the rest of the shop hole and under and the fuselage. Another view coming up here of the, from the wingtip camera. You can see again a nose down attitude. And this is an important aspect of VTOL, any kind of vertical flight, you need to take this into consideration. Uh, what kind of a descent rate, what kind of an angle of descent do you want to have on this aircraft? We had the anthropomorphic dummies installed. Uh, we have to do that for certification. You can see the dummies here. Ram and Shia, uh, I no idea about what those names mean, but you can see they didn't have a shoulder on as your but the spinal loading issue is what, what came up here, and that's and over the years with the FA we've developed the, the understanding that, that anything under 1,500 pounds of spinal loading is, uh, is okay and it does not cause serious injury. Uh, again, rate of descent, uh, I don't care if it's VTOL, I don't care if it's aircraft, sailplanes, whatever it is, the fact of the matter is, is that you have, to, you have to test for the worst case scenario, which is, in our case, 5,000 foot density altitude. Uh, 30, 32 feet, one feet per second is typically within the range, 21 to 31 feet per second. When we're dealing with VTOLs, uh, that enters in a whole different realm because typically you don't have the kind of gear uh, that an aircraft would have. Um, some will, some won't, and uh, that impact is going to have to be mitigated through, through structures uh, in, incorporated in the aircraft frame as well as the design of the parachute. It's a great, great little video that CNN did for us uh, and showed nationwide, worldwide. A uh, gentleman in Gap, Gap, Francis. It was a beautiful day for well, I'll, I'll let the CNN Bert people talk. Of New Sterling was piloting his small two seater a thousand feet above some idyllic French countryside near the town of Gap. In an instant, it became a pilot worth night to. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw an airplane climbing right towards him. That's a that's a great great video showing the showing what happened. I guess the, I guess the guy was extremely overjoyed that he had a person on board. Otherwise, it would have been pretty pretty catastrophic. Nice little montage of uh, of the, some of the saves that we've had uh, over the last last year or two. Uh, all pretty dramatic. All people that never thought they were going to need the parachute. Uh, uh, one in particular that stands out is this this one here, where the father was taking his daughter to tour some colleges. On the East Coast, uh, they lost an engine over a, resident, a commercial area. The parachute uh, came out, service landed in a little green area, and the father and daughter are hugging and thankful for the, for the parachute that saved both their lives. Um, this is a final one of the final videos I have, but it, it's a pretty emotional one. But it's one of our saves that we had uh, a father of a, a family man and a father of a young boy uh, that 
have it use it uh, via a parish. And I think it's worth hearing just from the emotional standpoint. It, it, it certainly uh, makes our, uh, our our stressful days less stressful when we watch videos like this or minus all the ladies that we're doing that to your hands. To my dear friends at DRS Systems, uh, this is James Meadows, and I am standing at W22 Buchanan, West Virginia. Uh, this is January the 3rd, 2016. Uh, and two years ago tomorrow, um, not very far away from that threshold, I would have become a willful palatable leaving at the time a widow, a three-week-old child, and a three-year-old son would have never got to see that if it wasn't for your uh, great creation. The days are hard and long, and uh, things suck. Remember, you guys are changing the world one life at a time, one parachute at a time, one airplane at a time, one engine at a time. You guys are heroes. Think strong. Thank you. So one of the... Uh, one of the most common questions that we ask about electric propulsion and electric uh, recovery issues uh, is the, why do we need a parachute on, on, on a VTOL? And there's, there's a lot of responses that I can give you on that, but some of the highlights of, of what my responses typically are are, are listed here. Um, with, with VTOL technology, uh, as some of you may have remembered back in the, in the ultralight days, one TV show showed one fatality and it completely shut down the, the burgeoning and growing, rapidly growing ultralight industry. I, I don't want to see the first thing, that kind of a thing happen with, with, with our industry, with the VTOL market. Um, the first Tesla auto fire was, was ridiculously overblown. There's cars with gasoline that catch fire all the time, but the first Tesla uh, auto fire uh, made the international news and it was quite a big uproar about that. A lot of hysterics. In the media when it comes to aviation accidents and any kind of new technology accidents. Um, even with electric aircraft, there's going to be a loss of control issue. Uh, there's a higher percentage of reciprocal engine, engine failures, but electric aircraft could, could burn and crash rather than crash and burn, and we need to be obviously concerned about that with, with the parachute deployments and how we're going to interact with parachutes with, with aircraft that have any sort of on, on board fires, and that's something that we aware of it, we're sort of working on it. Um, isolating rocket igniters from straight voltage when you have an electric ignition, you have to be extremely careful with, with the inadvertent deployments. Not a problem anymore because of the isolation techniques we've developed. I'll get into this a little later, the VTOL coffin corner. This is what isolates and, and makes unique uh, uh, parachute development for VTOLs because there is that coffin corner at 10 to 50 meters where a parachute will not work, any kind of a parachute won't work, uh, at least a parachute that's capable also of working at high speeds and high altitudes. Um, exposed, exposed blades, uh, there's a, of course a chance of parachute entanglement, severance of the attachment hardware. We've, we've certainly looked into that over the years with push air aircraft. Uh, we, have, we have engineering capabilities to, to mitigate the chance of any kind of a blade strike and severance of the parachute quite catastrophic, but that can be that can be prevented. Uh, autonomous activation, we talked about that earlier. Uh, there's an issue of descending into congested areas with exposed rotating blades. Uh, I'm working myself at, at VRS uh, indirectly with a company that's going to incorporate a laser warning device. Uh, as you can imagine, if you've got a VTOL coming down into a crowded residential area under a parachute, you better be warning people on the ground that there's something coming from above that, that could cause injury. So here's the coffin corner that we talked about. Basically, if you read your dad, uh, when it comes to parachute deployments, you got to give me airspeed or you got to give me altitude. I have, one, have to have one or the other to make the parachute work. Uh, so you can see the optimal, optimal uh, takeoff for this particular configuration would be give me airspeed. You can stay at low altitude, but give me airspeed. As you, as you gain that airspeed, you can then uh, begin to increase your, your altitude as well. So uh, stay out of the red. Those are areas that a, that a typical parachute will not function. Uh, certainly in a high probability, won't function, depending on altitude and airspeed. 
details and are going to be blind. Um, but again, as I said before, if I can give you a parachute that's going to work in a very low altitude or low speeds, but I can't give you a parachute that's going to work also at high speeds and high altitudes. That now has changed. We now have in development a parachute system that will work extremely low altitudes and low speeds, but also be functional and useful at the high speeds, uh, terminal dive speeds and that. This is a great little video that shows what we were talking about earlier. If you can imagine the VTOL coming down in a crowded soccer field or playground, and that's going to happen. There's no question about it. And we need to warn people on the ground that there's a VTOL coming down uh, above the land, either under a parachute or under emergency descent. Uh, and this laser device is going to help us to do that, to warn people that the airborne object coming down. Uh, common questions, and what's lowest altitude, which the save has been successful? Uh, we've had ultralight saves that have been documented at 150 feet. Uh, that's when the handle was pulled. However, we all have to understand that, that realization that you're in trouble and that you need to pull a chute can take two or three seconds. Uh, when you're at low altitude, that's an extremely uh, expensive uh, uh, amount of time to take up uh, that could be used in deploying the parachutes. And that, that gets back into our autonomous flight. We've had certified airplanes, Cessna 182s, that have been deployed uh, at the 375 feet above the ground. But it's not an issue of altitude. I really don't even like to add, give you altitude because what I need to ask is how much time do I have? Give you an example, if I'm flying at 200 miles an hour, 100 feet off the deck, I can, have a, I can deploy a parachute which is going to open. But if I'm doing 200 miles an hour on a vertical dive, it's not going to open. So it's not an issue of low altitude, it's an issue of how much time you put in. Largest aircraft uh, we've applied, we're, we're developing parachutes in the six to eight to 10,000 pound uh, gross vehicle weight uh, area. We've, we've done higher, higher uh, capable parachutes than that for other applications that weren't aviation related. But that's, that's uh, uh, the, the, it's basically geometry of one square foot of material per pound of, of weight, which is good. you can use as a general rule. Um, sink rates, uh, we talked about that before. Anything under 31, 30 feet per second is certainly acceptable. Even higher than that if you incorporate uh, shock mitigation technology into your aircraft, high G seats, airbag, these kind of things can certainly help you have a higher descent rate, uh, but yet still have more protection for the occupants. Uh, the higher the descent rate, the smaller the parachute, the less it weighs, the less it costs. It's, it's important to think of VRS parachutes as a, a system-oriented uh, device. In other words, if you develop your aircraft with the idea of having a shock mitigation technology on board, we can give you a much smaller weight. Um, sometimes we get asked, can, can uh, when these when these airliners go down uh, with, with either terrorist uh, motivations or or uh, any kind of loss of command, can we have the parachute deployed autonomously from the ground? We could do that, uh, but that's something that's that's uh, raises a lot of questions, a lot of a lot of issues. And especially when it comes to autonomous VTOL flight, uh, there's been a lot of discussions. Of should we have a ground-based system that will will sense that a particular VTOL is in trouble and make a make a decision on the ground uh, that, that that particular VTOL needs to have its parachute deployed. It raises a lot of lot of concerns um, and a lot of uh, interesting algorithms that would have to be written that, that we're working on now, but it's something I'm sure that someday will will happen. Um, so that's basically it. Um, Gwen and Paul, I, I think, uh, of course, my last slide, my engineers love to show this one. They, they have a weird sense of humor, but nevertheless, I promise I'll show it. So there you have it. Great, Boris. Thanks. A uh, couple of questions. Um, so you, you touched on it a little bit, uh, but could you maybe expand a, a little bit on how um, single passenger or personal flying devices are, are different from a typical two or four seat aircraft? and um, how a um, parachute system might be designed 
differently. Um, and particularly one of the things I didn't hear you touch on was uh, scenarios where uh, an operator might be uh, wearing um, the, uh, the flying device versus getting inside of it. First part of the question, there really isn't anything different between a single passenger aircraft or multi-passenger multi aircraft. It's just simple matter of geometry. The bigger parachute, um, uh, the unfortunate thing is the bigger the parachute, the longer it takes to open. And dealing with these VTOLs and single passenger aircraft, that your, the low altitude uh, flight envelope is going to require a very fast opening device. So you want the parachute to be as small as possible uh, to open as fast as possible. So it, 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 and the second part of your question, I'm sorry. Uh, what about um, uh, flying devices where the, uh, the device might be worn by an operator versus an operator getting into the device? Yeah, we get asked that quite a bit by, especially by aerobatic pilots. Uh, the fact of the matter is having a backpack chute or a seat, a regular backpack or seat back chute really requires you to get out of that airplane. And getting out of an airplane is really difficult, especially if you're, you're sustaining high Gs. Uh, I've been there. I had a collapsed hang glider back in the 70s, and I can tell you that I could barely raise my arms, up, much less get a parachute or get myself out. So the whole point of ballistic parachutes is that it is a much more rapidly deployed parachute. And when you get into VTOLs, that becomes absolutely critical. There's no way you're going to get out of a parachute, out of a VTOL aircraft at the kind of altitudes that we're talking about in general uh, with a backpack parachute and expect it to open on top of the it. It's just, it's just not going to happen. And um, important for, for any aircraft, of course, is uh, things like weight and size. Uh, but for, for personal VTOL, uh, I think that is especially so. Uh, do you have any advice for people who are designing a, a VTOL device uh, and thinking about a ballistic parachute addition to it later on? Is that something they should think about in their designs uh, to leave space and weight for that sort of system? Or is this something that can be added on later um, with uh, minimal extra engineering? The, the earlier you can integrate and think about integrating the parachute, ballistic parachute into your aircraft, no matter what it is, uh, the, the, the less expensive, the less time, and the more efficient it becomes uh, as far as its usability. Absolutely. This, this, rather than having the parachute be considered an add-on, uh, it needs to be considered part of your original design structure. And I can give you multiple, multiple examples in general aviation and, and even some of the VTOLs today of manufacturers and developers who, who, who approach the, the parachute as an integral part of the, the design structure. As you can imagine, trying to put a parachute on uh, after you've already designed an aircraft and make it cosmetically appealing. Uh, much less functional is extremely important. So yes, it, it is to your advantage as a developer and designer to think about how you're going to put that parachute in, in the aircraft. Consider the weight balance issues. Consider the, the, the total weight, the the, um, the distance between the activating panel and the, and the parachute itself. So there's a lot of things that are going to force you to to recreate part of that structure if you do it after the fact. And that's 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 not a very efficient. And then you also mentioned that um, low speed, low altitude applications uh, might need to incorporate uh, both a ballistic parachute as well as some, some shock absorbing uh, mechanism. Uh, does BRS have uh, those shock absorbing mechanisms as well that you can pair with the ballistic parachutes for, for people thinking about VTOL? You know, we, don't, we don't directly have those systems incorporated in, but we certainly have uh, partner companies that do incorporate them. To give you an example, Cirrus uh, has, since day one, put a small aluminum honeycomb pad underneath the seats of their aircraft. Uh, these are just a one or two inch high pad aluminum honeycomb. They've had 77 deployments, and those, those seat pads have been very effective in mitigating and lowering that spinal loading that we talked about earlier. So uh, that's one aspect. The other aspect is the landing gear. You want to have you want to have landing gear that's capable of, of, of obviously taking hard landings, but also keep that issue in mind about the parachute the vertical descent. If you can incorporate a, a high G seat uh, with the with the vertical capability to mitigate that, that shock load in the spine, 
that's again going to allow you to use a smaller parachute, which means a faster parachute, a lighter parachute, and a less expensive parachute. Great. And then finally, um, what are what are some words of advice you have for GoFly competitors designing their personal uh, VTOL devices in terms of um, maximizing the safety? I don't think anything that's going to be in the air at any altitude in the airspeed will get away with not having some sort of a decelerator. I'm, 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 not, I'm using decelerator instead of a parachute because it's important. There are other, other developments that we're, we're involved with that, that will challenge the definition of what a parachute is. Um, even at the low altitude that we're talking about, you can have a decelerator that's going to not only give you a vertical, sustainable vertical descent, but think of it as a, as a large air brake. It, it's simply, a, it could be a, nothing but a drag chute. You've got horizontal speed and no altitude. You're always better to have your, your impacts be lowered as quickly and as much as possible. And the only way to do that uh, is what's with some sort of an aerodynamic accelerator. Now, if you incorporate, as we mentioned before, if you incorporate that, that really low altitude parachute system with some shock mitigation devices, airbags, uh, good seat belts, seats, uh, and I, landing gear is, is going to be tricky with VTOLs because a lot of them don't have uh, really aerodynamic wings. Uh, they're, they're strictly a, a multi-copter uh, device. So uh, coming down on your gear is going to be the best scenario, but not necessarily the only scenario. So if you're coming down nose first and God forbid you're upside down or something, you've got to think about these issues when you're designing a, a safety system when you're into your VTOL. Anything can happen in the air, bird strikes, mid-air collisions, pilot incapacitation. I can give you hundreds and hundreds of scenarios where, where the best design aircraft and the best capable pilots, the highly, highly trained pilots, highly experienced pilots that need to use a parachute. So my advice is that think long and hard about how you can mitigate the possibilities of somebody being hurt and killed in your, in your detail. And that's gonna secure an industry for us looking forward into the future that is so important to all of us at this point. Great. Thanks. And to say a few parting words, uh, I'll invite Gwen back in. Thanks, Paul. And thank you very much, Boris. Uh, we all have learned uh, a tremendous amount about safety and our BR and BRS systems. So, so thank you for this master lecture. Uh, to all phase two teams, we remind you that uh, Boris is available for one-on-one -on -one safety consultations for all of you. So uh, please do not hesitate, <coughs> excuse me, to go to the phase two website and to uh, access the way to contact Boris uh, so that you can take advantage of that safety consultation. And then once we go into phase three as well, there are additional uh, free and discounted offerings from BRS Aerospace as well. So thank you all, especially Boris, thank you very much for this informative master lecture. And we look forward to seeing you all at the next master lecture. Thank you. Thank you.